Charles Chittad Eng, it is the judgment and sentence of this court of which the jury found you guilty on February 24th, 1999. And it's just like I told the judge, may God forgive me, I want him dead. Charles Ng has shown nothing but contempt for life, for law, for anything and everything good. He has killed many people and for no reason other than for his amusement. They were dismembered, burned, and then I feel that they were crushed in some manner. And the jury having found all 11 murders to be of the first degree. This is a cartoon that shows a Asian individual and he has a child by the legs and it appears that what he's doing is he's cooking this child. What kind of person does that to a child, to a baby? And the jury having returned a verdict that the penalty shall be death. I mean, if I had to deliver a message to Charles Ng, it would be, you know, you better repent now because when the angel of death comes, the time for mercy is over. I don't want to be this car road. You fucking give me a show trial and fucking judge. I don't want to get to the jury. No, that's not me. In 1984, Charles Ng, a Hong Kong British subject, and Leonard Lake, a native Californian, committed a series of horrific crimes that devastated the lives of everyone they touched. Their shared obsessions of militarism and lurid sexual fantasy led to kidnap, torture, and murder. And the evidence they left behind stands as testimony to the mayhem they created. Lake recorded his state of mind in his journal. Ng charted the murders in a series of cartoons and they videoed the torture of the women they held as sex slaves. Ng talked to us from prison during his trial. These are horrendous stuff that they accuse me of doing. You know, I can't even hurt a puppy. And Lake talked about their fantasies in his homemade philosophy tape. What I want is an off-the-shelf sex partner. The combined sadistic energies of these two men became a lethal cocktail, and their story shows how devastating such deviance can become when it goes undetected. When Leonard Lake was arrested in 1985, he committed suicide, and it has taken 15 years to bring Charles Ng to justice. And whilst Ng protests his innocence, and this woman, Lake's ex-wife, has immunity on 19 counts of murder. This is the story of the horrors created by this trio and their devastating impact on the lives of so many more than their 25 victims. Charles Chittad Ng, you are remanded to the care custody of... Charles Ng has spent those 15 years in solitary confinement, and the man that knows Ng better than most is his lawyer, Public Defender Bill Kelly. In speaking about Charles Ng's personality, if you appeared annoyed or irritated, he initially, let's say you're arguing with him about something, he starts to assert himself. Once you assert himself, you assert yourself. Um, uh, typically, he, he just withdraws and becomes very meek and uh, kind of goes into a shell. I would say he's um, without confidence, almost childlike in a lot of ways. Born on Christmas Eve 1960 in Hong Kong, Charles Ng was a constant disappointment to his demanding father. As a child, he fought hard against his family's expectations. This led to severe and repeated beatings. Patrick Callahan, a criminal psychologist and an authority on this case, has spent many hours in conversation with Ng. Kenneth Ng, uh, Charles' father, uh, was seriously physically abusive of uh, Charles. Uh, interesting to note is that while he was being physically abusive, he was saying it was to make him strong, him, Charles, strong, and he was also saying while he was being beaten and tethered to uh, a window, I love you. I'm doing this to make you strong. It's for your own good. But this only made him withdraw further into a fantasy world of violence and martial arts. He began to set fire to cars and to his school. Charles Ng had become a disgrace to his proud middle-class family. 
1977, he was sent to a private school in England. But Ing could not bond with this new environment. He became more violent, stole from fellow pupils, and harassed his teacher with sexually explicit letters. He was then sent to San Francisco to live with relatives. And in October 1979, using a fake birth certificate, Ing joined the U.S. Marines. Now, the Marine Corps, of course, is not an individual, but he saw the organization as a, something that he could belong to and attach himself to and be part of, something he never really felt with his father. Ing had also found an environment that encouraged his love of violence. But within two years, Ing had been arrested for stealing weapons. He escaped, went on the run, and sought out an ex-Marine he had contacted through a right-wing survivalist magazine. That man was Leonard Lake. He was to become the father figure Ing had been searching for and would fuel his violent sexual fantasies. Good evening. It's a Sunday in October. 22nd, 23rd, something like that. Very close to my 38th birthday. And I'm starting this tape without script or without any real organization of what I want to say. But I do feel a need to explain. At 17, Lake was an angry loner, showing signs of retarded sexual development. When he read a classic novel called The Collector, it proved the catalyst for the deviant fantasies that would shape his adult life. The Collector is a chilling story of an obsessive young man isolated from the world. He fixates on a young woman, Miranda, and imprisons her in the hope she will grow to love him. Lake became obsessed with this tale, and over the next 20 years distorted it into a plan to imprison women as sex slaves. He called this plan Project Miranda after the imprisoned woman in The Collector and called his victims M-Ladies. He even laid out a set of rules by which he would force his Miranda to live. Just to quote number three is, I must never show my disrespect either verbally or silent. I must never cross my arms or legs in front of my body or clench my fists and unless eating must always keep my lips parted. So you can see from that that Leonard not only wanted physical domination, but he wanted psychological domination. He wanted them to be totally open to him so that they lost their individuality, lost their personhood, and totally became his victim. I believe that I can if I can construct a holding cell, I can create a facility that is so stark and so empty that fairly quickly by a combination of uh, painful punishments when I'm displeased, I can quickly condition a young woman to cooperate with me fully it may not work. However, I want to try. What had led Lake to such a warped attitude towards women was a repeated and compounding series of rejections. First as a child when his adored mother abandoned him. Then by his beloved Marines when he was discharged with severe psychological problems after two tours of Vietnam. And the last straw was his first wife divorcing him as he later confided to his sister. Looking back on all of the events, I think it certainly was a significant one in terms of his developing, or reinforcement, I should say, reinforcement of his hatred of women. Ah, let's see. Despite this hatred, Lake was to find a woman who shared his extreme sexual appetite. In 1980, he met Cricket Balash, and a year later they were married. Infant you into my sweet little half. 
Her strong sexual hold on Lake would give Cricket a controlling influence over him until his death. He felt so rejected by women that someone like Cricket, who was not particularly beautiful or intelligent, for him to be involved with someone like that, I think, reflects his own self-esteem problems. That, to me, was clearly a dynamic, even though he claimed to be smarter and cleverer than her. He had no power in the relationship. But a relationship Lake could control was about to begin. Charles Ng was on the run after his arms theft from the Marines. He fled to Leonard Lake, his survivalist pen pal. Ng remembers the first time he met this man. At the time, I need somewhere to stay, so this is why I was uh, led to him. He's older than me, of course, like 10 years or more, and, you know, I just took, uh, took to him pretty much like a, a, a brotherly, fatherly figure. As a threesome, they got along very well, and they spent a lot of time together. They lived very cooperatively and collaboratively. They, had, they shared care of the dog. They, I mean, they lived like a family. In Charles Ng, Lake had found the perfect partner to help him realize his project Miranda. And Ng's initiation was his exposure to the extreme sexual games played by Lake and Cricket. I mean, that, that, they, they got this kind of bondage, uh, like whips and, and handcuffs and, and, um, and uh, stuff like that in the house. So, I mean, and I can be overheard it sometime when I'm in the living room or kitchen cooking when they're doing this thing in the bathroom. When he observed that, there was an ab reaction or there was a connection between the wedding of pain and love that he felt in his relationship with his father and his mother. And, and that, again, bonded him more closely to Lake and to Cricket. Ng's life with his surrogate family was abruptly shattered when he and Lake were arrested by the FBI for weapons theft. Ng went to prison while Lake jumped bail and began life as a fugitive. And as he wrote in his journal, Lake completely severed his links with society. Amusing. Our land of the free is not prepared to deal effectively with a truly free man. What can they do to one who carries cyanide in his pocket when death holds no fears? From the time that Lenny became a fugitive, he had told us that he'd been experimenting to find the right dose of cyanide that would um, kill a man, an adult male, and that he was to keep this cyanide capsule with him at all times, um, a fresh one, so that in the event that he were ever captured, that he, was, he would rather die than be imprisoned. In 1983, Lake persuaded Cricket to buy a house in the remote hills of Calaveras County, three hours from San Francisco. The quiet hamlet of Wilseyville was the perfect base for Project Miranda. Wilseyville is, is typical of a small town up here in the foothills. I think most people are drawn up here for its beauty and it's, it's quiet and uh, its openness. I think Leonard Lake was drawn here for the isolation. It was a uh, ideal place for him. Nobody bothered him. Nobody recognized him. Nobody would ask him any questions. Lake began his obsessive search for the perfect M lady, the woman he would hold captive in his bunker. I like very slim women, very pretty, of course. Petite, small-breasted, long hair. I certainly enjoy sex. I certainly enjoy the dominance of climbing on a woman and using your body. Lake needed a new identity, which meant cold-bloodedly murdering his best friend, Charles Gennar. And he needed money to build the bunker close to his house. So he lured his brother Donnie up to Wilseyville. Lenny came to pick up Donnie to take him to this supposed house-sitting job. He 
shot him in the head while he was asleep. He put, like, point blank, he shot him in the head. To pull off Project Miranda, Lake would require a constant supply of money and new identities. Gunnar and Lake's brother, Donnie, were only the beginning. Then in June 1984, Ing was released from prison. He headed straight for his newfound family in Wilseyville. Finally, Leonard Lake, Charles Ing and Cricket Balash were together again. Now, Operation Miranda could truly begin. Within the next year, a total of 25 people would disappear from San Francisco and the Wilseyville area, never to be seen again. The bunker was ready, and Project Miranda had indeed begun. Lake's chilling fantasy was finally underway. It will be interesting to see how far this tape and I actually go. Leonard Lake, a name not seen or used much these days. My next year is a fugitive. Still, with death in my pocket and fantasy, my major goal. The bunker was built. Project Miranda was go. And the next year would see at least 25 violent deaths. The murders that were perpetrated by Leonard Lake and Charles Ng are very complex. They include individual murders. They include families where a whole family is murdered. And they include the murder of children. Sean Dubbs and his parents, Harvey and Deborah, were abducted from their home in San Francisco when Lake and Ng came to buy their video camera. And back in Wilseyville, Brenda O'Connor, Lonnie Bond and their baby were abducted from the house next door to Lakes. The fate of Sean Dobbs and Lonnie Bond Jr. is unknown, but Ing's cartoons suggest a horrifying end. The children were perhaps tortured uh, to further gain the compliance of the women. Brenda O'Connor, Kathy Allen and possibly Deborah Dubbs were imprisoned as M ladies, tortured and then killed. The men were killed quite quickly uh, because they were a physical threat to Lake and Ng. And again, the fact that they couldn't leave any witnesses led to the death of many of these people. But when Lake and Ng abducted Paul Cosner, they could not have reckoned on the desperate persistence with which his sister Sharon Salito would search for Paul. My connection with the Ng case is that um, my brother Paul Cosner was one of their victims. He um, put an ad in the Chronicle in 1984 to sell a car, a Honda Prelude, and um, Leonard Lake answered the ad decided my brother looked enough like him to use his ID. Sharon reported Paul's disappearance to the police, but was told they wouldn't look for a missing person over six years of age, but they would look for a stolen car. My brother's missing. Nobody cares at all or will even do anything, but a $5,000 stinking car is gone and you're gonna send somebody over right away. So Sharon undertook her own search fly posting the city with pictures of Paul. Now I didn't sleep, I didn't eat. I kept thinking if I could think of everything to do. But it's like if I forgot one thing, that it wouldn't work. 
Sharon's fight to find her brother was not completely in vain. By reporting his car missing every month for seven months, she kept the vehicle on the hot sheet. And on June 2nd, 1985, this was instrumental in the capture of the men that abducted her brother. Because on that day, Lake and Ng went to a hardware store in San Francisco and attempted to steal a vice. When confronted, Ng fled the scene, leaving Lake to deal with the police. On checking the Honda Prelude Lake was driving, the police found a gun with an illegal silencer. At the police station, Lake was cautioned and asked for his identity card. The car was traced to Paul Cosner and the ID card to another missing person, Scott Stapley. Determined not to be taken alive, Lake swallowed two cyanide capsules he kept sewn in the lapel of his jacket. Before he poisoned himself, Lake wrote a suicide note to Cricket, his ex-wife. Dearest Cricket, I love you, I forgive you. Freedom is better than all else. Love, Leonard. Before he lost consciousness, Lake gave the police Ng's name. Mr. Ng is very clear. He believes that uh, he was given up by uh, Leonard Lake in order to give time for Cricket to get away and uh, for her also to uh, dispose of whatever evidence there may be up at Wilsonville. But Ng was not completely betrayed. Cricket took him downtown to collect his clothes and guns. Then she drove him to San Francisco airport. And while Lake was unconscious in hospital, Ng escaped. Cricket had called and told me that Lenny had swallowed his cyanide capsule. He was on life support. So about midnight that night, my mother and my younger sister and I went to Kaiser and <clears throat> there were detectives waiting for us in the waiting room of the intensive care unit who wanted to ask us questions about Lenny and of course at this point we had no idea of anything that was about to unfold. Within the four days it took Leonard Lake to die, this insignificant shoplifting incident grew into a horrifying case of mass murder. Police had searched Paul Cosner's car and found bullet holes as well as an electricity bill in the name of Cricket Balash that linked her to the Wilseyville property. After being questioned by the police, Cricket took her chance. It was June 3rd. It was the day after my brother swallowed the cyanide capsule that Cricket came to my mother's house. She was very nervous. She was very agitated. She actually asked me to go up with her to the Wilseyville house to, what she said, get some personal belongings out of the house that she did not want the police to see. Lake's sister refused to go with Cricket, but Lake's mother agreed. And my mother told me later that she filled several bo cardboard boxes of things, including videotapes. The next day, police went with Cricket up to Lake's house but there was no way they could ever have imagined the magnitude of the crimes they would uncover there. The case just started just mushrooming up from there. And when the inspector from San Francisco found that video equipment to the Debs family, I think that's when things really started to roll. The police found bullet holes and blood stains in the house. This is the bed where the sides had the four holes, or the two holes in each end, that looked like they were used for restraint. And next to the bed was the video camera stolen from the Dubs family. The camera Lake had used to film the building of his bunker and the execution of his crimes. So, here it is. A cut in the earth about... 21 feet across. Backhoe worked for 24 hours. Myself and two young men with our little picks and shovels and wheelbarrows worked for another three or four days. Cricket became more nervous with every find. 
and refused to let the police search the padlocked bunker close to the house. Later on that day, we, uh, we then brought the search warrant to the residence and took a look around the grounds. And at that point in time, um, there was a, uh, a, a tool shed. It had all the regular tools, just a typical workshop. And it was from there, detectives, after looking at it, noticed that the wall went farther back into the hillside. And then as they dug around a little more, they found that there was quite a bit of the building that went back into the dirt. So that made them think, well, how do you get in? And they started looking, and they found a secret uh, passageway. What we're looking at is what has been described as the inner cell area of this bunker. As you can see, the door was hidden with a two far Shelf. The inner cell of the bunker was actually two different compartments. In the first, they found a copy of the collector, and tacked to the wall were photographs of 21 semi-clothed young women. A two-way mirror provided a spy hole into the second compartment, which was in fact a tiny airless cell. Next to the mirror was a night sight, allowing Lake to see into the darkness. So actually in the cell, if you go in there and close the door and turn the lights out, it's very much like being in a mine shaft. It's just pitch black and you can't hear. The police assumed that people had been held captive here. But who were they? And why were they held? Lake had buried evidence in front of the bunker that would enable the police to unravel this mystery. They discovered Lake's journal detailing the last 18 months of his life and his philosophy tape expounding his plans for Project Miranda. But most chilling, was a video labeled the M Ladies tape, filmed in Lake's house and showing Lake and Ing torturing innocent women. If you don't go along with us, we'll probably take you into bed, tie you down, rape you, shoot you, and bury you. What appears interesting is, at least of the two M Ladies that we know, that they were not as easy to control as Leonard had a thought, and thus I, I, I think their, the, their deaths were premature. At first, police had no idea who these two women were, or whether they were alive or dead, until they found a trench that was 50 yards long and contained the driving licenses of Kathy Allen and Brenda O'Connor, the two women on the M Ladies tape. Amongst hundreds of other items of personal belongings, the police also found Paul Cosner's ID and evidence that Brenda's best friend had also perished. So it was right in here that they found a, uh, articles of clothing belonging to some of our victims, one of them being Scott Stapley. Uh, he had a shirt that had his name Scott written above the pocket. The property was literally strewn with human bone that had been burnt or crushed. And this is a plot, or plot five, and in this area, it appeared that they would bring the ashes down and just throw them out. It took police eight weeks to sift through these grisly remains. We found some uh, teeth, we found some baby teeth, so we knew that there was some, at least one child uh, that had been uh, murdered as well. Uh, we wound up with probably about 45 pounds of this bone that could constitute as many as six or eight humans. So we knew that we had a large number of people that had been killed. At this point, only six identifiable bodies had been found. From the bones and other evidence, they estimated at least another 17 victims. I dug a big section 
Like this, uh... Three weeks later, the police found more bodies of two men released into the woods and then hunted down for sport and shot as they tried to escape. One of the bodies had handcuffs, had ligatures. Both of these victims were shot. And it was right down in this area that there were tufts of fabric and material on the ground that had been dug up by predators. And that's where the, uh, the bodies of Lonnie Bond and Scott Stapley were found. The pistol was shoved on his throat and it was rammed around, breaking all of his teeth out, and then he was shot. Uh, it just makes us shudder to think the torture and what he must have been going through. Why did this have to happen to these people? And, and uh, uh, two, two men causing such tragedy in the lives of so many people, and not just the family lives uh, of the victims, but other people who were affected during the investigation. It's been hot and tedious for, for the victims' families, their fight for justice was just beginning. Many had no loved ones to bury. The police had no suspects to question. And the family's pain was being made all too public by the media. And my ma answering machine was blinking, and I turned it on, and they said, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Stapley, this is so-and-so from such-and-such -such television station in San Francisco. We would like to talk to you about your son, Robin, and the murders in Calaveras County. Our telephone number is blah, 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 blah. Please call us. But today we have pictures, pictures that will probably leave many people we with We were watching the news one night, and all of a sudden, on the TV, there's my daughter sitting in a chair in shackles and him cutting her clothes off. And she was begging for the baby. These are some of the bone fragments that have been found, pieces of human beings, and investigators say there are countless and fragments just like And they just kept talking. They'd show their hands on the TV at night, and it would have marble-sized chunks of bone. And you didn't know if it was Paul, you know? But in nobody's wildest imagination did we expect it to be this bad and this horrible. The shocking discoveries at Wilseyville had left the police with many questions and the victim's relatives reeling, desperate for justice. But Lake was dead and Cricket refused to give any information without immunity. That left Charles Ng and he had vanished. An international manhunt was underway then on July 6, 1985, Ng attempted to shoplift from the Hudson Bay department store, Calgary, in Canada. He was arrested. Within hours, FBI agents were in Calgary to verify that this man was Charles Ng and to take him back to California. But the Canadian government refused to extradite Ng to a state where he could face the death penalty. It took six years of campaigning by Sharon Salito and other victims' relatives as well as political wrangling between governments before Ng faced an extradition hearing. He doesn't have any rights. He made a decision and it was the wrong one and he deserves to suffer the consequences. Once the extradition was granted, Ng was on a plane back to California within the hour. And I knew that they had had this Ng task force all the time, this whole six years that he'd been in Canada, they were just gonna kind of have to pick them up and dust them off and the process would begin and um, that's not what happened. The next seven years saw a succession of delays due to mismanagement of the case and Ng turning jailhouse lawyer. Ng isn't even a, an American citizen and he's managed to use our legal system better and longer than any criminal in the history of the United States that was born here. He um, changed attorneys like he changed his socks. Five teams of defense lawyers, seven judges, and three trial start dates came and went. Finally, in 1994, Ng was given the lawyer that would defend him at trial. I was appointed Charles Ng's lawyer in November of 1994. 
immediately uh, I went up to Calaveras County just to get a sense of how large the file was. And I was, of course, dumbstruck. Six tons of paper and machinery and bookshelves and all that. Probably four tons of paper. That's what we estimated. Ng had been charged with the murder of 12 of the 25 Wilseyville victims. Kelly needed three years to prepare this huge case. Then we realized that we had waited 14 years for a trial that was a farce. They had spent $20 million um, putting this together um, for what? It was unbelievable. It is ludicrous for this defendant to come to court and ask for any relief. What we're looking at now is a motion for new trial. Ng That's did everything he could to disrupt the trial. He presented dozens of motions to the court, including complaints of travel sickness and bad food. Looking sorry, at a Kelly. motion... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mr. Ng appears to be sort of dozing off here. Mr. Ring, are, uh, are you uh, able to, to uh, listen to what's going on? No, I'm not able to concentrate, sir. Why? I'm not tired. How much sleep did you get last night? I didn't stay up all night. Why? Packing and uh, finishing up this motion that I today. You're working on the motions that you filed today? Yes. Not much to pack. The last straw came when Ng telephoned a juror in an effort to cause a mistrial. After I found out that it was in fact Charles Ng that had called me and had been able to reach out from his cell and, and get into my house. And it's scary. He, he doesn't belong here. I couldn't just leave it at court anymore. It was at home with me now. And I resent that. Leonard Lake clearly had a great deal of influence over Mr. Ray. The victim's relatives endured eight months of horrific evidence and a defense case that presented Lake as the manipulator and Ng merely an accomplice. The evidence fails to show that he was an actual killer. The one person who knew the truth was not questioned in the trial by either side for fear she would damage their case. For despite damning evidence, Cricket Balage had been given immunity on 19 counts of murder. She knew what was going on. I think she procured, girl, I think she lured people up there for them. And I think um, she was a willing participant also. Um, let's see, we talked about underage performers. And, uh, There's one particular case conversation where uh, Cricket is actually seen looking at photographic albums of young girls. But I've seen some awfully cute looking little 14, 16 year olds that uh, I envy, that I wouldn't mind watching them do something interesting. Uh, and, they, and they mentioned uh, uh, making some of the girls at the school disappear. At that time, Cricket was a teacher's aide at, at a school. I think it was a high school. They're actually talking about making people disappear. But the immunity agreement stood. I mean, she, you know, they couldn't prove that she lied, and, uh, and so there it was. And so off she went. So the prosecution could get Cricket Balash to court, but they could not risk questioning her on the stand. But they did have two pieces of evidence that were damning proof of Ng's true role in the Wilseyville murders. But now, unfortunately, Ng did a number of drawings uh, some of which specifically were connected to the, the victims in, in the trial. As pieces of evidence, uh, they were not good from, from my perspective. Uh, what you have here uh, is um, two individuals, and it appears that what they are doing is they are dropping this person into a fire. We just don't want to believe uh, that uh, these two men uh, were capable of taking living human beings and placing them into a fire because we know from the fourth picture that they were awake because they were able to speak when they were placed in, 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 in the fire. Few of the victims' bodies were ever found, just the crushed bones from the many burn sites scattered around the property. 
However, the evidence that finally proved Ng's guilt to the jury was the M lady's tape. Kathy Allen and then Brenda O'Connor were kept prisoner in the bunker cell. The videotape shows them brought to this room in Lake's house. Their clothes were cut off at knife point. They were threatened with rape, beatings, and the death of their babies and themselves. This tape cannot be uh, taken, lost out, and barrel the way it is. This is like a free scene of the, you know, first scene is Lennon Lake with Kathy Allen with me. The second scene was a massage scene. The first scene was uh, Lennon Lake talking to uh, Kathy Allen when I'm not in the property at all. The fourth scene is Brenda O'Connor scene with uh, uh, Lennon Lake, me. That's, that's basically the totality of the tape. The tape that my daughter was on, it was a tape of torture, mental torture, and him cutting her clothes off and everything had a truly big effect on the jury. The one juror still has nightmares, still hears my daughter's voice. And Brenda just wanted to know where her baby was and the oh, sleep like a rock, you know, and laughing at her and making fun of her. And then when they had her stripped down to take her to the shower, she got faint. And Leonard Lake is over there fondling her and pretending to be nice to her and, oh, here, let me help you. And it just made me sick. It still makes me sick. Because the tape only lasts, I mean, the, the salmon that I was involved in only lasts uh, at, at the most 20 minutes. And the, the prosecution tried to tell the jury that this 20 minutes, this is the real Charles thing. But there's no doubt that, that, that Charles Ng enjoyed what he did. And in his drawings, the cartoons that he produced, he does state in one of them, no kill, no thrill, which would suggest that for him, the enjoyment, what he got out of the behavior that is exhibited on M ladies was the thrill of control. The trial they had waited 14 years for lasted eight months. And in February 1999, the jury gave their verdicts on 12 counts of murder. For Sharon Salito, those verdicts proved a devastating end to her long fight for justice. Before they ever even started, my mother was sitting there with her hands in her lap, turned up, and the tears were just running down her face and filling up her hands. And the court clerk got up and read the verdicts. We, the jury, in the above entitled case, find the defendant, Charles Chitat Ng, guilty. They go, you know, count one, and they go, guilty, 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 guilty. And they'd say count two and go, guilty. Juror number seven. It was 11 murder ones. Juror number eight, is this your verdict? And a Miss and Paul. Juror number nine, is this your verdict? And I couldn't Juror take it. It was like 124 damn guilties, and they couldn't do one stinking guilty for Paul. My name is David Douglas Bond. I'm the brother of Lonnie Wayne Bond and the uncle of Lonnie Wayne Jr. And the uh, brother-in-law of Brenda O'Connor. In 85, Mr. Ng took, the, the, took their lives by murder, rape, and pillage. The part of the punishment is listening to what you, the, the havoc that you've caused, the pain that you've caused to the families, and that they are your victims too. The baby was beautiful and he loved his grandpa. He followed him all over. May God forgive me, but I want Charles ain't dead. Everybody in that courtroom, every family member, was a victim of Charles Ng and Leonard Lake. I don't have any fancy speech to give you. I just wanted to come up here and stand before you and tell you that my sister was loved and is missed very, very much. There are times, many times, Dwight and I cling to and hold each other and silently scream for the unendurable loss of our youngest son. We sometimes cry for hours and hours with longing to see our dear son Scott again. No one should ever have to lose a child, especially in such a sadistic manner. Human beings deserve dignity and death. 
Deborah Harvey and Sean Dubs, Kathleen Allen, Brenda O'Connor, Lonnie and Lonnie Bond Jr., Scott Stapley, Cliff Parento, Jeff Gerald, Michael Carroll, and my brother deserved to live, and Charles Ng, you deserve to die. Charles Chittad Ng, it is the judgment and sentence of this court that you shall be punished by death. <laughs> Said penalty to be inflicted within the walls of the California State Prison at San Quentin, California. I don't want to be in this car road. You fucking give me a show trial, you fucking judge. You've read all the cases, Mr. Ng. No, that's not Mr. Ng. Uh, Mr. Ng, please. Charles Ng is now on death row in San Quentin prison. His execution is unlikely to happen within the next 15 years. Leonard Lake is dead and has never been punished. And Crooked Balash is enjoying a new life in San Francisco. Most of the victim's families have no remains to bury and so have never been able to lay their loved ones to rest. Remarkably, some can draw hope from this terrible ordeal. There have been good things happen to us all the way through. You know, people are good. There's a saying that no matter how anything evil happens, good will come of it. And this has been just about as evil as anything can be. And everything we've had are just as good as anything could be.